Hello and welcome to the top 10 most likely unseen issues for the May 2016 operational case study on bath and body product manufacturer Sanchez Navarra. So before we start, I'm just going to go through a bit of an introduction to this particular video and where I've got the information on and what you need to do with said information. So how have I come up with these top 10? Well, first of all, you look at the focus in the pre-scene. If there's a lot of material in the pre-scene on a certain topic, then it's likely that there is some kind of importance of that topic. It's likely to be brought up in the exam, so there's more to talk about. And that feeds into the second point here, the degree of importance attached to it by the examiner. But that particular section extends beyond purely what's in the pre-scene, but also what SEMA like to examine. For example, ethics. It may be that there's no real mention of ethics in the case study, but ethics is considered very important by SEMA, and therefore they are likely to examine it. Next is the strategic importance. How important is it to the organization? If a certain topic is very important to the company, for example, say uh, their suppliers. If they rely very heavily on a certain supplier, then it's likely that there might be an issue on the supplier. If something were to happen to that supplier, what impact could that have on the business? And also, just a more general experience in doing these videos in creating mock exams and reviewing exams in the past, the typical kind of issues that come up and what kind of things have the examiner brought up in the past. And my final point here is about how easy it is to write issues on that subject. The people who write the exams are obviously people too, and they will go for ones that they know, go for ones that they know that they can write good questions on. So what do you need to do for these issues? Well, first of all, it's important to prepare key models. So this will be things like your SWOT exam, like uh, SWOT analysis, like your PESEL analysis. Because building up this information now will help you to adapt the new information given you in the unseen or help you to have that, that context to apply the unseen material. Next thing you need to do is practice exam questions on these issues. And this will help you to understand the kind of questions that will be asked around these topics and how to answer them. And also, this next section here, it will help you to plan these answers in your mind so that when you go into the exam and you start writing, you will already have a background to in which to apply this new information. You'll already have certain points to bring up in your head as you're writing for them. And I've also put some more generic things here, such as the advantages and disadvantages of these certain topics, uh, where they would be used and how models can be used to support them. So let's move on to the top 10 issues now. So let's move on to the issues then. And my first issue here is funding. Now, the reason why I've chosen funding as a top 10 issue is because it's something that generally comes up in most exams. And the reason why it comes up is because there is so much you can talk about it. You have lots of different topics that you can bring in, such as equity, debt, the differences between equity and debt, financing, also issues relating to capital and cash flow, and again, dividend policies, as I've put here. Now, dividend policies forms more of a, a management and strategic level thing as its own topic, but it can still be applied to the operational case study. Now, for example, as Sanchez Navarra is now a privately, well, it was always a privately owned company, but now that it is owned by the TRU group, will the dividend policy have to change? When the founders of the organization may have like to reinvest more money into the business, are the TRU group going to want to take more money out of the business? They want to use it to, to gain money, to gain value for the TRU group as a whole. Another reason why funding is very important is because even if it isn't there as its own topic, it's often used as part of other questions. Now, for example, it could be that 
uh, the company is deciding on a new project. This could be buying a new machine, it could be introducing a new product, going into a new market, but regardless, it will be, uh, it will require financing. And therefore, that's where your funding comes in. Does the company have enough funding for that new project? And so these are some of the, the likely issues, some of which I've already brought up here. That they need funding for new machinery or to buy another company to, to purchase a new piece of technology. Or you may just be asked to suggest how they could raise more finance. And of course, then you would go back to your advantages and disadvantages of equity and debt financing and which one is best and which one is best for the company. And I've put another bit here about working capital. If you remember from the pre-scene, they had a very poor working capital cycle due to these huge levels of inventory days that they had. And I've just reiterated a point here that it's often used as an add-on issue rather than an issue in itself. So be, be careful to, or be mindful to think about funding whenever you are discussing a new project or anything to do with the company. You have to think about the financial situation of the company and will they need to raise more money in order to carry on with the goal that they are trying to achieve, to fund the new project. If the project is beneficial, then it's worth perhaps raising finance for. If it's not that beneficial, then you have to question whether it's worth the risk that comes with raising additional financing. And so things relating to the pre-scene here that could relate to funding. We saw at the end of 2015 that the cash flow was very low. They only had 517,000 K dollars in cash. Now, we do not have any idea about how much investment is required for certain projects within this industry at the moment, but that's not that much money, particularly given the company's revenue of 31 million K dollars. And we also have to bear in mind that not all of that money will be available for investment. That's not pure income that's there just to spend how you please. A lot of it will already be allocated. They may have a certain financial strategy in place where they have to have a minimum amount of cash as a buffer, in which case you cannot go below that certain level. One of the things I've put here is that if they cut their stock levels, they would perhaps have less need of such large warehouses and they could perhaps get a smaller one that would free up income for more investments. The financial statements of the company also showed that they had a very low debt to equity level of only 2.55%. So that could mean that the banks would be more inclined to give the company a loan because the company is not already burdened by large amounts of debts and therefore more likely to be able to pay it off. They also have quite a substantial amount of assets av available at the moment. We saw an increase in the assets in the balance sheet as well. So it could be that we sell some of those assets to raise money or we use those assets as security to raise debt against. So for example, we go to the bank and say, we'll put this particular warehouse, this particular office, etc., up as collateral for a bank loan, in which case we are more likely to get the loan and get it at a better rate because the bank has that security against the loan. And finally, I've put here a suggested order of raising funds. Now, this is more for if you are asked a more objective question about funding as a whole, but you can also apply it to uh, projects that the company is considering. So this is basically the order in which a company the size of Sanchez Navarra should be considering raising money. And the first one, of course, is to use cash for investments if they have it, because cash they already have, and if so they may as well spend that first. Now, of course, we don't know how much they have available at the moment. So I've assumed, in a sense, almost that they have none, unless we are told that, we are, that some of that money can be used. In which case, their first option should be to try and get some additional investment from the TRU group. As a large multinational organization, it more likely has a, a full-blown financial department that deals with things like this, which deals with investing in its subsidiaries. After that, you then move on to your debt funding. So 
securing loans against your assets at a smaller rate than perhaps a pure bank loan where the the risk on the bank's behalf would have to be balanced against a higher interest rate, which of course would mean higher finance costs. And the next one is to sell your existing assets, to sell some of the, the warehouses, for example, or sell some of the shops that the company owns. And I put a little bit here about ones that are less consistent with the company's strategy. Now, the point of this bit is, is that that is why the selling existing assets is at the bottom, because the company is looking to invest in property. We saw in the pre-scene that it valued its investments in property and was seeing good returns from it. Therefore, to sell off that assets would not be consistent with the way that the company is currently operating. And then finally, we have equity financing. Now, we know that Sanchez Navarra cannot trade on the stock market because it's a privately owned company. But the TRU group, we weren't given any information about it, whether it was a listed company or not. But if it isn't, then the TRU group could raise money by selling and trading on the stock market. And if it already is, then it could perhaps release some more shares to raise additional funds. Now, the reason why I've put equity financing last is because usually it's a very complicated way of raising finance. Now, of course, the advantage of it is that you do not have to pay all the money back, or you may never have to pay the money back. But it does mean that you have to give up more control of the organization. And finally, some theories on funding that you can use. Now, first one here relates to equity funding. Now, obviously, that's not necessarily going to be that important or that applied to Sanchez Navarro, but I'll put a bit about it anyway. Now, dividend signaling is essentially when paying out dividends signalizes more than just the fact you're paying dividends. Now, certain shareholders will want dividends and certain ones won't. If you are a perhaps uh, a young professional with a high paying salary who also has shares in a company, you necessarily you wouldn't necessarily want dividends because of the high tax on them. And you'd rather see gains through the share price going up. Whereas if you were retired, you perhaps would rely on dividends being paid out as an income, as it were. Now, dividend signaling can often mean that you, uh, to the stock market that you do not have any ideas for going forward. That, that's what some people can read into it, because otherwise, if you did, you would be using that money to reinvest into the organization. And of course, by paying out dividends as well, you are also lowering the value of the organization because that's money that the company has that you are paying out. So it's money that the company no longer has. And then, of course, some advantages and disadvantages of debt and equity. So, of course, debt funding is often quicker. It's often cheaper in the way that you do not need to give up control of your organization. Sometimes raising money on the stock market can be very expensive. You have to pay a very high premium on selling shares. However, debt financing has to be paid back, whereas there is not necessarily any need to pay back equity. And as well, coming back to dividends, dividends are optional. You do not have that. It may obviously affect who invests in your company and how happy they are with their investment in your company, but it is not mandatory. But of course, paying off interest to the bank is mandatory and you, of course, will get into trouble if you do not. So now we'll move on to the next issue, which is on risk management. Now, of course, risk management, again, is one of these big overarching topics that you should always be thinking about whenever you are answering any question. And of course, it's also a very important key P1 topic. In fact, it's one of the most likely to be examined P1 topics. And certain things that you'll have to do is to identify risks, think of how and think of how you will control those risks. And just like funding, this can be applied to any uh, question. So if you, for, again, if you are being asked a question on a new project, you have to think of the risks of this project. It may sound good on paper, but what kinds of risks of going ahead with this project can you foresee? 
So again, likely issues, identifying risks in a specific project. So for example, if the new project was to expand into a new market, what are the risks of that? You have exchange rate risks, you have political risks if there's political instability within that country, and how do you deal with it? And then again, the risk management of it. Coming back to those risks we identified about expanding into another country, how do you deal with this risk? How do you mitigate the effect of those risks or how do you avoid them altogether? And again, this could be an add-on to a particular project, a question on a particular project, or you could be asked about how the organization as a whole would manage risks. So we know from looking at the pre-scene that a lot of their uh, revenue comes from one source. It comes from the concession lands. A lot of it comes from the body wash. So how do we manage the risk associated with that? It could be by expanding into more markets, expanding into more products. It could be by putting more resources behind the other products that the company produces so that we have a more balanced portfolio of products. And certain things that you can bring up here is such as risk methodology, the various uh, ways of managing risks that you've studied in your P1 exam, the role of the audit committee. Of course, we do not know if there is any established audit committee within Sanchez Navarra or within the TRU group. And if they don't, then perhaps that is a key weakness of the organization because it affects their ability to manage their risks. And also cultural as well. Certain cultures, be it national cultures or cultures within certain organizations may have different attitudes to risk. You may be working for a company that's very blasé when it comes to risks and they don't really think about it. Or you may have one that is very, very diligent and analyzes every single thing they do in case of certain risks or to identify certain risks. And so some points here related to the pre-scene, things like how perhaps they have many different suppliers for all these different things. They're getting the different products or different ingredients from lots of different suppliers. And could that, that could be good because it means that they have the best ingredients for each thing. But on the other hand, by having so many different suppliers you run the risk, it could be that they are quite small and therefore they're more likely to collapse and then where do you get your ingredients from? This of course being different to buying from a, a large supplier that produces a lot of the ingredients you use. That supplier is likely to have more supplier power, however they are also more likely to be stable and there's more, more chance of going into a more joint venture with them. Also things like falling margins, we saw a decrease in profit this year even though they had an increase in revenue and also the major source of income from the body wash and from the concession stands and this coupled with the the dominated market or the dominated generic market so there's not much opportunity there so are they at risk of reaching their apex quite soon where they cannot cannot expand any further and therefore they need to look to going into other markets in order to continue seeing growth. I've also put about that here, a lack of new products and markets. They talk about expanding overseas, they talk about producing new products, but there hasn't been any for a fairly long time. So some theories that you can use here. Obviously there's the the cost of risk methodology here that you've learned in P1, and I've given you a diagram here of that. So just follow those steps through as you're applying it to any kind of risk. I've also put the, the risk management model here, the TARA model. So this is obviously transfer, accept, reduce, and avoid. So if we were to apply this to say, expanding to a new market overseas, where perhaps there is political instability, how would we deal with this risk? We could transfer it by perhaps licensing our products to a company that already exists in that country. We could accept that risk by just thinking that's the way that country is. There's nothing we can do about it. We could reduce it by rather than licensing our product, we go into a sort of joint venture with a company that already exists over there. Or we could avoid it by simply not entering that market altogether. 
And again, another bit here about the audit committee. We do not know if there is one yet or whether it would be necessary for this type of company. However, we could say that if they did have an audit committee, a designated audit committee, it could help with their risk management strategies. So I hope you've enjoyed this sample video and more importantly found it useful. Before I go, I'd like to quickly tell you about a few of the products that we do here at Astranti Financial Training, specifically for our case study courses. We have a study text which details all the key theories in which you will be expected to use in your case study exam, as well as details of how to approach the pre-scene and the case study. We also have a series of course videos detailing how to answer case study questions. This is actually an area in which many students struggle. Most of the scripts that I've seen, the failing scripts that I've seen, has actually been due to poor case study technique rather than lack of knowledge. We also have a series of pre-scene analysis videos based on the current up-to-date pre-scene detailing all the key bits of information and likely issues you may face in the exam. Next up is the industry analysis, a pack detailing information about the industry that the precinct company resides in, information about the key players within that industry and more background information on the industry in general. We also have a range of mock exams created for each level and based on the current precinct which is a great way to get some practice in before you sit the real thing. We also offer marking and feedback on those mock exams so you can see where you are going wrong and where you can improve. Finally, we have the master classes. These are two one-day classes taken by our expert tutors to give you all the, the hints and tips you need to really add to your chances of passing the exam. Also, if you take our full course, we offer a pass guarantee, which provided you have met all the requirements of the pass guarantee, you will get a free reset on the next exam should you fail to pass. So once again, thank you for your time. If you're interested in any of these products, please visit the website www.astranti.com for more information. Thank you.